FBI agents Joe and his team arrive at the residence of a man recently found murdered while relaxing at home. Upon further investigation, they discover that the murder was carried out in a manner identical to previous killings, suggesting it was the work of the same individual. The distinctive hallmark of the murders is a 5-inch instrument used to puncture the base of the victim's skulls, precisely targeting the connection between the brainstem and the spinal cord. The team refers to this area as the medulla oblongata. They are left wondering about the motive behind the killer's choice of this particular method. Frustrated by the series of murders and his inability to catch the killer, Joe decides to seek help from his longtime psychic friend John. Catherine, one of Joe's colleagues, is hesitant about bringing an outsider into such a complicated case, but Joe is resolute. He reassures her that John has been instrumental in solving other cases in the past. The next day, Joe and Catherine head to meet John. On the way, Joe shares that John has been deeply affected by the loss of his daughter to leukemia two years ago, a tragedy that shattered his marriage. Unable to cope with his grief, John gave up his medical career and retreated to live in isolation in the countryside. When Joe and Catherine reach John's home, Joe explains why they have come, but John is reluctant to get involved, preferring the quiet life he has built. However, shortly after, Catherine interrupts with news of an emergency call, and Joe introduces her to John. Before leaving, Catherine hands over the case files to John, asking him to reconsider their request. She pats him on the shoulder, and as she does, John suddenly has a vision of Catherine with a gunshot wound to her head, blood streaming down her face. After they leave, John listens to an opera record that stirs memories of his daughter's vibrant life and the painful moments leading to her death. Moved by these memories, he decides to review the case file. While reading through the details, he notices a note left by the killer. Strangely, the words on the note match the lyrics of the music he's playing at that moment. Alarmed by this coincidence, John rushes outside and experiences a vision of a strange man, whom he believes to be the killer. He senses that the man is on a mission, one that can only be stopped if he is killed. This revelation compels John to change his mind and agree to help his friends catch the serial killer. The following day, John arrives in the city, where Joe and Catherine pick him up. They brief him on the murder cases, emphasizing the killer's methodical approach and the fact that he leaves no trace behind. Later, they visit the home of the serial killer's first victim, and John learns more about the circumstances of her death. While Joe steps away to take a call from his wife, John asks Catherine for her thoughts on the note left by the killer. Mm. Catherine explains that it resembles a classic riddle, and she recites a line that eerily matches what John had seen earlier. She suggests that the killer may be taunting them, offering clues without any real intention of being caught. Afterward, Catherine heads home, and Joe and John go out for dinner. During the meal, John tells a joke, and they both share a smile. Joe mentions how John's smile was one of the reasons Elizabeth, John's wife, had fallen in love with him. In a light-hearted moment, Joe taps John on the shoulder, and John is struck by a disturbing vision of Joe lying in a hospital bed, though he chooses not to mention it. Later, as they drive home, Joe asks if John sees anything that might help them close the case quickly. John replies that, for now, nothing of significance has come to him. That night, as Joe heads to his hotel room, he is haunted by flashbacks of his daughter suffering in the hospital. He also has visions of a shadowy cross, a train station, and the word Atticus. Along with these images, he sees Catherine once again with a gunshot wound to her head. That same night, John is awakened by a call from Joe about another murder. At the crime scene, they find a note left by the killer with the time 4.16, which eerily matches the exact time they arrived. The victim is discovered in a bathtub, murdered in the same fashion as the others. When Joe touches the victim, he experiences a vision of her coming home to what she believes is a romantic gesture prepared by her husband. As she relaxes in the tub, the killer strikes from behind. John cautions them not to touch the water, though he has yet to understand why. However, one of the agents announces they have a suspect named David Raymond, the woman's husband. He is brought in for questioning, where they inform him of his wife's death, which shocks him. David asks if his wife left him a letter, suggesting she might have committed suicide. Catherine questions why he would think that, 
and David explains that he left her a letter before hastily leaving the house the previous night. When asked why he left in such a hurry, David admits he was leaving her for another woman. Meanwhile, John, who has already had a vision of David, knows he is not being completely honest and requests to speak with him. John confronts David, revealing that he wasn't leaving his wife for a woman, but for a man. He also discloses that David had contracted HIV, leaving David visibly shaken. After the interrogation, Joe informs John that a test confirmed David's deceased wife had also contracted HIV. This revelation makes Joe realize why John had warned them not to touch the water earlier. Later, Joe invites John to have breakfast at his home. While serving them, Joe's wife, Laura, casually mentions that she is still in contact with John's estranged wife, Elizabeth, and admits that she still loves John. As the conversation shifts back to the case, John observes a pattern. All the victims had terminal illnesses. He concludes that a killer specifically targets individuals who are already dying. However, Joe challenges his theory by pointing out that a young boy, one of the killer's victims, had been perfectly healthy with no recorded medical issues. John suggests they visit the boy's parents to learn more. Since Joe has an appointment, he asks Catherine to accompany John instead. On the way to the boy's family, Catherine asks if John has any mystical or religious powers. John clarifies that what he possesses is a heightened form of human intuition. Curious, Catherine asks if he can see anything about her in that moment, but John responds that he sees nothing significant. When they arrive at the home of the deceased boy, they are met by his grieving father. Catherine mentions that they may have discovered the reason behind his son's murder and asks if the boy had been healthy before his death. The father confirms that his son was in good health prior to the incident. Shortly after, the boy's mother joins them, and Catherine explains that an autopsy might reveal any underlying illnesses that could help their investigation. However, the parents, being Christian scientists, refuse the autopsy as their faith rejects traditional medical practices. They insist that their son's death was God's will. John, empathizing with the parents, shares the story of his daughter's death. He explains his belief that even medicine cannot alter God's plan, but argues that conducting an autopsy might prevent other innocent deaths. Reluctantly, the parents agree to the procedure. During the autopsy, John receives a fax from the killer, instructing him to examine the child's cerebellar lobe. Following the direction, the doctor discovers a pea-sized tumor in the boy's brain, confirming John's suspicion that the killer targets terminally ill individuals. Immediately after this discovery, John abruptly leaves the lab without a word. Concerned, Joe follows him, wanting to understand why he left so suddenly. John reveals that the killer shares a similar ability to foresee the future, and he realizes the murderer is leading them into a trap. This startling realization makes John consider abandoning the case. Later that night, while John is packing his bags, Catherine visits him, frustrated by his decision to walk away just when they are so close to solving the case. John confesses his doubts, expressing that the killer's meticulous methods and focus on terminally ill victims, people who are already fated to die, make him question whether they can truly stop him. Catherine argues that it is still murder, regardless of the victim's conditions. She then asks if John would feel the same way if his own daughter had been one of the victims. Her question leaves John in silent contemplation. Sensing that John is withholding information, Catherine pushes him to reveal what he knows about the case. Instead, John turns the conversation to Catherine's past, revealing that she once had a baby and gave it up for adoption, something she deeply regrets. He shares more intimate details that bring Catherine to tears. Desperate for more, Catherine urges John to tell her about her future, but John refuses, gently asking her to go home without disclosing his vision of her being shot. Later that night, the team receives intel on the killer's possible location. Joe and his team launch a raid, only to discover a horrifying scene. The victim's body parts have been dismembered and used to create grotesque art. The disturbing tableau leaves Joe both confused and frustrated, uncertain if they are still dealing with the same killer or if another twisted individual is now involved. Meanwhile, John is on his way out of town sitting on the bus when he begins to experience his usual visions. This time he sees flowers, frogs, and choristers singing on a podium. Luckily, Joe manages to catch up with him and pleads for John's help in tracking down and stopping the killer. 
Moved by Joe's request, John agrees to return and assist them. On their way back, Joe shares that they discovered traces of snail poison in the flowers found in the last victim's bath water. Joe explains that there is only one place these flowers could have come from. He takes John to the flower field, and when John touches one of the flowers, he envisions a garbage can in the middle of the field. The officers search the garbage can and find the bottom portion of a dress that was hanging at the scene of the gruesome murder. Using a police dog, they trace the scent to a potential suspect's location. John, sensing imminent danger, still follows the dog's lead along with Joe and the rest of the team. Upon arriving at the location, they find a young man holding a mug decorated with frogs, matching one of John's earlier visions. Suddenly, the young man shoots Joe and escapes through a window. John urgently calls for an ambulance, and he and Catherine pursue the shooter. The young man shoots a cab driver and hijacks his car in an attempt to escape. However, with John's psychic abilities guiding them, they manage to keep up. During the chase, their car crashes. As John crawls out of the wreck, he has a vision that warns him the young man will kill him if he stands up, so he stays low, allowing Catherine to shoot the suspect, Linus. Despite the shooting, John realizes that Linus was not their primary suspect as he was unable to foresee his own death. This realization causes Catherine to scream in frustration. John later visits Joe in the hospital, where Joe appears frail. It is revealed that Joe is in the advanced stages of cancer and doesn't have much time left. John had known this through his visions, but refrained from sharing it, not wanting to upset Joe. During their conversation, Joe asks John to look after his family once he's gone and encourages him to reconcile with his estranged wife. In a heartbreaking twist of fate, Joe eventually succumbs to his illness, leaving his loved ones, friends, and colleagues in deep sorrow. At Joe's funeral, John gives Joe's son a comforting hug and experiences a vision of a bright future for the boy, offering John some solace. One night while John is at a bar, the killer reveals himself. He confides in John, explaining that he doesn't take pleasure in his actions. Instead, he claims that he sees the future suffering of his victims, people with terminal illnesses enduring unbearable pain, and that their pleas for mercy compel him to end their suffering. The killer also admits to orchestrating Joe's shooting, intending to spare him the prolonged agony he would have faced due to his illness. The killer defends his actions, arguing that the hardest acts of love are often the most painful to commit. As the killer speaks, John envisions alerting the officers at the bar, but the killer has already foreseen the outcome. Before John can act, the killer falsely accuses John of being armed, prompting the officers to restrain John while the killer makes his escape. In the aftermath of the bar incident, Catherine and her team managed to create a composite sketch of the killer based on the waitress's description. However, his full identity remains unknown, prompting Catherine to push for a deeper investigation. Meanwhile, John continues his search for the killer on the streets, despite being plagued by distracting visions of the strangers he encounters. Eventually, he tracks down the killer, who is already in the process of carrying out his next murder. The scene shifts to a man entering his apartment, finding champagne and a congratulatory note waiting for him. As he starts to drink the champagne, John arrives at the house to stop the killer's plan. The homeowner is startled to see two strangers in his living room. The killer instructs the man to sit down and tries to justify his actions. However, John tells him that he cannot play God. Realizing that John will not allow him to proceed, the killer flees the scene. Before leaving, John warns the homeowner that he has been poisoned and urges him to call for an ambulance. Meanwhile, Catherine and her team finally uncover the killer's full identity and raid his residence. However, the killer had anticipated their arrival and left a recorded message for Catherine, speaking as if he were present. He claims that he is not a psychopath and believes he is doing the victims a favor by ending their lives painlessly, sparing them the inevitable suffering they would face in the future. John continues his pursuit of the killer, following him through the streets until they arrive at a train station. John's visions become clearer, revealing details he had seen before. The killer boards the train, and John quickly follows. Once on board, the killer fires a shot into the air, causing the passengers to panic and flee, leaving him and John alone. Meanwhile, Catherine receives a report on the killer's location and rushes to the train station. Despite orders to stay back on the train, 
The killer insists that he and John are alike, but John disagrees, asserting that he is not a killer. The killer then reveals that he is terminally ill and begs John to end his suffering by killing him. As the train reaches the next station, John notices the sign Atticus, which he has seen repeatedly in his visions. At that moment, he gets a vivid premonition of Catherine being shot by the killer. Just as Catherine arrives on the train, the killer shoots at her. John pushes her out of the way and takes the bullet meant for her. In the ensuing struggle, John returns fire killing the killer. Catherine is unharmed and John sustains only a non-life-threatening injury. John undergoes surgery to remove the bullet lodged in his head. Upon his release from the hospital, he reunites with his wife, stirring memories of his daughter's final moments. It is finally revealed that John's deep emotional turmoil stemmed not only from his daughter's death, but also from the fact that he had to end her suffering himself. This revelation mirrors the killer's assertion that the hardest acts of love are often the most difficult to commit. If you want interesting movie recaps, like, share, and subscribe to follow us for more movie recaps.